So you've just finished watching Netflix's new dramatic historical feature, The King, and you probably have some questions or want to talk about it. I'm Cody Bonds. I have a background in archaeology for film, adapting history for audiences, and joining me today is my wife and ever awesome, Dr. Rachel Lynn. Hello. Dramaturg and former costume designer. Yes, and I have a PhD in interdisciplinary arts with a specialization in theater. Which is especially relevant considering the film we're talking about today. So if we don't cover something you'd like to talk about, make sure to leave a question about it below. The movie in question is an adaptation of Shakespeare's Henry V. I would say a loose adaptation. Well, that that's one of the interesting things that I think about the film is, is it a moment of history that they've chosen to adapt? Or is it Shakespeare's play that they've chosen to adapt? Or is it some combination of the two? Yeah, initially when it was advertised, they specifically avoided ever mentioning Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's very obvious when you watch the film that they basically took scenes from Henry IV, Part I, Part II, and Henry V, Mm -hmm. and then rewrote them. Uh, Yeah, and took characters from it as well. Mm Mm-hmm. And made some allusion to um, Shakespeare's play that weren't are not historical. So where else would that source material be coming from? So there is an homage in there. Yeah, it's definitely one of those films that I figured if they weren't going the Shakespeare route, I figured they would have gone the historical route. But the history in this film is bad. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, there's no nice way of saying that, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they, they hit the, the high points, but how you get there, the motivations of characters, mm-hmm. who dies when, mm-hmm. just completely falls apart. And... You know, this is coming from someone who, like, I, I love the movie Braveheart. I, I think most people do. And it, it's ter- its history is terrible. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, it gets a pass because everything's, I don't know why. Why, why do we uh, give Braveheart a pass? Yet in this case, it's mm-hmm. a film that you, you kind of feel icky about when you get to the end. Yeah, and that, that's really just for the, the two of us, I think. I think it feels like Braveheart keeps the big historical moments that we can um, yeah. authenticate and it, it plays a little fast and loose with the more intimate um, machinations, uh, the interior life of the characters, which we cannot authenticate, and therefore you can use your imagination to a certain extent. Um, here, that doesn't seem to be the case. There are people who are actually dying in the wrong locations um, at the wrong times um, and have very strange relationships that they could not have had historically, mm-hmm. um, and they're also not really borrowed from Shakespeare either, so you can't really give it a pass on that level either. Yeah, I like to say that certain films get the spirit of the era right. Like 300, not historically accurate, but I think a Spartan would watch that movie and stand up and applaud at the end. They they, they would recognize (laughs) themselves. And when I watched The King, I was struck by how wrong the characterization of Henry V was in many ways. Mm -hmm. He, uh, this is not a hit on Timothy Chalamet's acting. I just thought he did a wonderful job. Yeah. But the the choice to make him an emo king Mm -hmm. is... Just the weirdest to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so starting at the beginning of the film, I guess, is the easiest place to begin. Uh, We start off with a Henry V who is not yet a king. He Mm -hmm. is a alcoholic playboy who is running around sleeping with anyone he can. Mm -hmm. And that's actually pretty historical. I mean, everyone agrees that Prince Hal, while he was a prince, was a bit of a roustabout, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And that's a really great place to start for a character as well. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, we don't we don't exactly start there though. He's already has a lot of his moral compass is already according to the film's ethics very true, mm-hmm. and that moral compass continues throughout. It actually never changes. So that's really that's really my issue with the film. So if you came to the film and you were looking for good solid acting, yeah. you were you were going to get that. Oh, yeah. Um, if you were coming looking for some of that kind of Shakespearean style language, you got you got that. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but the things that I come to a film looking for is a really nice arc, plot, um, and themat- thematic structure, and those weren't really there. It was very flat in those fields he at the beginning he's looking for um ad, an advisor he finds some advisors and he has some questions about those advisors and then at the end he finds another advisor so he just kind of pops from one advisor to the next mm-hmm. and doesn't really grow at all he, he kind of just picks advisors at random that comes back to bite him 
And then he does it again. But that's his last act in the film is to be like, you random person I just met, I'm going to do everything you say. In this case, you're talking about the fact that he started with Falstaff and then moved on to the Lord William guy. Mm-hmm. And then finally... And then the back queen. to Falstaff. Yeah. He did everything that Falstaff said. And then, I mean, if you haven't seen the movie, I'm about to spoil it for you. He dies. <laughs> Uh, and he's like, what do I do now? I'm gonna, and then he kills the other one. And now he's advisorless. And he's like, well, you have really nice cheekbones. You're my new advisor. And that was his narrative arc. That was it. Yeah, the inclusion of Sir John Falstaff is sort of interesting to me. So Falstaff is a creation of Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. But he's based on an actual person named John Oldcastle, who you know Prince Henry was known to fool around with. But in reality, Oldcastle, the actual person, lived far after Agincourt by about two or three years and was actually burned alive as a heretic mm-hmm. by Prince Henry. Mm-hmm. Um, and in Shakespeare's version, he dies before Agincourt. Mm-hmm. And in, in when you watch the movie, they actually take a pot shot at Shakespeare yes, they in do. the middle of it. Yeah, John, John Falstaff, he's going to have this great epic ending. And he says, well, it's either this or I die in a, in a pub in Shrewsbury. And this is the better story. And you're like, okay, you can say a lot of things, but you can't say... I'm about to write a better ending than Shakespeare did. You just can't. You just yeah. can't say I that. mean, you have 400 years of somebody re- repeating the same story yeah. over and over again. The only it's reason much. you're doing it now is because Shakespeare wrote it. Yeah. Mm, I, will, I will say we as a couple are probably defensive of, uh, oh, yeah. of Henry V because we did name our son after Henry V. Now, we may be biased is what we're admitting. Oh, yeah. Definitely important to admit you're biased here. <laughs> but, yeah, just like the weird... So I'm just going to get into the weird history decisions this film made because they just really blew my mind. The very first thing you see is Henry Hotspur stabbing a guy on the ground after a battle in Scotland. And it just seems to be a random guy. Like, he doesn't even seem to know if it's his guy or somebody else's guy. He's like, oh, you're crawling the wrong direction, peasant, and then mm-hmm. stabs him. Mm-hmm. And that, that really sets the tone for the level of care of this medieval world and this is one of my personal pet peeves when it comes to medieval movies is the belief that law didn't exist Mm -hmm. before the modern era Mm -hmm. and then everybody before now must have been an absolutely crappy person and look how far we've advanced Mm -hmm. and that just keeps coming up again and again and again especially in the first half of the film. the exception to that rule and he seems to be born the exception to that rule Mm -hmm. that he's some kind of man out of his own time and that takes all the fun out of historical dramas because the the fun of it is that we get to see how other people lived in the world before we got here so that we can then compare it to the way that we live in the world and make new choices and see new things. Yeah, this is a pacifist Henry V. Throughout the entire film, he begrudgingly fights and begrudgingly fights the French. Mm -hmm. There are very few things we know for sure about Henry V, but that man hated the French. Mm -hmm. Like, when he was, what, in his 20s, before he was even king, he Mm -hmm. tried to get his country to go to war, and the only reason they stopped him Mm -hmm. is because his his dad basically kicked him off the war council. Mm It just the, the series of events in the film is, is so mixed up. You know, one of the first things we said is the character seems like he has a real distaste for war, and we never really see where that's coming from. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, when he was 14, he was sent to Wales. He was forced to do this horrible Welsh campaign, and it culminates in the Battle of Shrewsbury, which is actually in the film where they do that, that duel scene, which is okay. obviously not historical. Right. But in that, he actually gets shot in the face with an arrow, mm-hmm. and it's this huge, horrible, bloody battle. And then after that, surprise, surprise, he basically has PTSD and becomes a bit of a you know layabout. You know he mm-hmm. wants to drink and party and have fun, and it's no wonder that this character develops some sort of issues he mm-hmm. doesn't get over for years to come. And see, that is an arc that gives you a, a past, to history from which to build, so that when he is again on a battlefield, you know what is happening internally in this character. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of conflict there. We don't have any sense that he's really internally conflicted. All of his he doesn't really make a lot of hard decisions uh he makes it feels he, like he every doesn't really de- make any decisions every decision is sort of forced on him it's yes. like oh the french are doing this you must now do this oh it's very reactionary it's like this is the next thing that i'm going to do stab stab uh but he's, he's very emotionless about it and and i don't really care about anyone in the movie that was really interesting to well, me you didn't like prince tomlin i mean prince thomas oh no i did you well, rec- I didn't care. Did you recognize that was Tomlin from Game of Thrones? No, I didn't. That was Prince Tomlin, the one who gets pushed out the window. Yeah, yeah. 
they got another, they got him to play a baby face That's prince right. again. That's yeah. right. That is him. Yeah, he dies. It doesn't matter. He's in the film for all of five minutes. Well, I didn't care. I mean, small children were murdered, and I did not care. Did you oh, care? Oh, yeah. That was, God, I forgot about that scene. There's this scene right after the Dauphin is introduced, which is Robert Pattinson swinging to the cheap seats. I mean. Oh, that that is that is the understatement. of the, this, is, this is how I felt about it. So I personally have issues watching um, things that I find embarrassing. So, for example, I can't watch the movie Meet the Parents. Mm-hmm. I can't because the, the, it's, it's too embarrassing. I have to walk out of the room. So Robert Pattinson walks on. And as an audience, I don't think that you're up to date on your Bridget Jones's diary, but I'm going to go out on a limb here. So at one point in Bridget Jones's diary, Bridget <laughs> Jones goes to what she thinks is a Tarts and Vickers party dressed as a Playboy bunny, but it's actually a Christmas party. That's how I feel about Robert Pattinson in this movie, that he thought he was coming to a Tarts and Vickers party. He's dressed up like a Playboy bunny. Nobody else is dressed up like anything, and he can't get a taxi home. So I just felt embarrassed for him the whole time. So it was really hard to watch. That's not. That's a pretty good description of his performance there because it's so different than every other performance <laughs> yeah. in the film. The film itself, I guess, could be described as understated. I mean, they, yeah. they seem to be going for you know very low key the entire time. I know mm. that uh, it was you described it to me as the quietest movie we had ever yeah, watched. Yeah, there's no soundtrack. Really, there's a couple of musical moments, and that that's really it. And then there were there were moments like. Two great heroes battling it out, dueling it out in front of the entire armies, and no one is moving. They're all just standing there, watching as they're stabbing at each other. No, nobody's like, "Oh, stab him in the nuts!" No, I mean, like if you've ever—I mean, I work in a high school. If there's a fight, you have 500 people crowding around each other, yelling and shouting about it. You're telling me the heads of two armies are fighting, and everybody's just standing there, emotionless, in a line. It's just For, for way after too. Nobody claps. When anyone dies, I guess, I guess what do you do when, when you stab well, your army just in the won. neck? You don't have to fight to death. Yeah, you, you, you should cheer. definitely, yeah, you should definitely cheer. You oh. should definitely hurrah there. And no one does. And it's so, it just feels like the most awkward thing that's ever happened. <laughs> like they should both just slink off the battlefield and apologize. I mean, in the fight scene, the choreography in that scene wasn't bad. I mean, it was, you know, well fought. I mean, mm-hmm. I would say that for basically most of the fight scenes in the film. Now, having said that, this this movie follows no medieval tactics that I have ever been made aware of mm-hmm. at all. The Battle of Agincourt, Agincourt or Agincourt, it really depends if you're American or British or French on that pronunciation, but that's either here nor there. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten a lot of crap yeah, about that. I've gotten sting. so much crap. But actually, I, did I tell you to ask the French teacher at my school how you pronounce, and then I showed him the word, and he goes, what is this? <laughs> he goes, I'm like, it's a small town in northern France. He goes, is it? <laughs> like, he's like, uh, I guess Azincourt? I don't know. He's like, he's like, I don't know. Why, why do I care? Why, why, does <laughs> why anyone, do I care? Why, why does anyone care video. about this? You know, this yeah. man's summer is in France and he doesn't get it, which I figure is about the appropriate way of describing oh, it. That's hard for historians to hear. All. <sighs> yeah, hurts. I know. It's the truth. You know, the truth hurts. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, the battle was so, so weird. Like, I was thinking about it after his words this afternoon. Mm-hmm. So you have two guys in what's called bright uh, bright plate. Basically, it's plate that's been shined up, you mm-hmm. know, it, which doesn't come around for another, you know, 50, 60 years afterwards. That's not important, though. Mm. But these two armies clash together in this great big muddy field. And it, it occurred to me, how do they know who they were attacking in this film? <laughs> like, you know, during the period, they would wear surcoats or they would wear, you know, like padded and painted, you know, stuff to let you know whose side you're on. In this fight, there's... There's no knowing that. It's just two guys in mud, and they're slapping each other. And it's just like, what, what is happening here? Also, the cavalry didn't use lances. Did you notice that? They just ran right in. You know, that mm. thing cavalry does. It was probably too dangerous, and the stunt people didn't think they could do it safely. I would guess. Yeah, we yeah. just found out. We looked up it a minute ago. The budget of this film is $23 million. 23 wow. Now, to give, you some, to give you some context, Braveheart cost $75 million. In 1994, mm-hmm. the Outlaw King movie was over a hundred. Really? Oh. Yeah. And when you start thinking about that, it's like this film makes so much more sense now because mm-hmm. it feels small in a weird sort of way. Yeah. Like you know, you could say it's intimate, but in reality, it's like here's a dude in a historic room wearing a semi-historic outfit. Yeah. Which. The costuming in this film is all over the place, by the way. Like, you, well, that, that it, would definitely be why. Because if you're, I know that they filmed a lot of it in, in England, so you can just go to Angels of London and it's a big costume 
shop. It's like a big costume closet. And they're going to have all the things that you need, Mm -hmm. especially if you need things like clergy. They're going to have clergy for days um, in every historical period. But if you want something more defined than that, uh, then you're going to have to make it yourself. So and that's, and that's called problems. pulling, is that right? Yeah. So yeah. You, you pull the costumes from right. existing and stock closets. Yeah, and, so and that's one of the reasons the that. BBC has always made so many costume dramas, is they're using costumes from the 50s, basically. Oh, yeah. They just keep pulling them year after year, same yeah, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So in this case, the entire film is basically pulled from a closet somewhere of existing costumes, which I suppose is why so much of it looked like it was from the 1300s. And everybody has a bowl cut, which is, I mean, so there were bowl cuts during this period. I'm not saying there were not bowl cuts, mm-hmm. but... Like, because there's the one painting of Henry V with a bowl cut. But, like, they have everybody have bowl cuts. Yeah, but that just reads to the audience um, that gives us a particular moment. That is the hairstyle we associate with that particular moment, and they just decided to go. There was a lot of consistency across the film. Mm. It felt very Visually, broke, oh yeah, it definitely. Kiriskuro, the darks were very dark, and there was there the palette was very consistent. Everything was very consistent. So for some people, I imagine that works really well, that you... That that's kind of lovely and that's that repeated pattern kind of way. For other people, that's not really going to work because you don't get the dynamics. There's no highs and lows, so it could feel like it drags, which it, it did for me. It so, did for me as well. Now, the, yeah. the word you used earlier was texture. It has the same texture across the mm-hmm. entire film. Like There was a, a richness to a lot of the rooms. A lot of the wood was highlighted by the lighting in ways that made it feel very ancient and lived in. But it was also very flat at the same time, that there w- wasn't a lot of detail to these. Especially if you look at the women's clothing, it was, it was uh, not very detailed. Mm-hmm. So it gave you kind of a flat look, which can look very ethereal. Or it can look very bland. I know that at several points they had Henry himself in like a large red cloth. Mm -hmm. Like it evoked an emotion, but it didn't really have any actual detail to it like you said just right, these really big slashes of color and that's just that's a, just a style choice and that's the way they decided to go it really felt like that across the board and so i appreciate that who whoever's ultimate vision that it was 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 very consistent and very strong um and that's kind of nice in its own way but if it if it doesn't work for you that might be why yeah you're not aligning with that vision so talking about robert pattinson right there with the, the moment where they kill the kids yeah. For unknown reasons, like it's like these are the kids that get wood from the camp, mm-hmm. and Robert Pattinson, the Dauphin, is going to personally yeah, track it, them down and murder them. That was weird. That they 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 need. I felt like they needed to make a villain. They felt very pressured. Um, th- the script felt very pressured to make him crazy villainous in order to give us some emotional attachment because. Frankly, we didn't have another way into it, and so they were like, "Well, just make him a make him a child murderer personally, like he personally is <laughs> personally do it. murders children." Yeah, they really seem to have jettisoned all the backstory for the battle going in here. I mean, the fact this is in the middle of the Hundred Years' War. This is not mm-hmm. coming out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. This isn't like, oh, suddenly you know we decide to invade. But it, it's really a story of family, and that's my favorite moment is actually the French king's speech about. Mm-hmm how family has brought them here um, to this moment of, in history and so many people's lives have been won and lost over familial um, spat, basically. Which would have been a great yeah. arc for the entire film. I would have liked we more just of that. didn't touch on. From, ironically, the Mad King of France right yeah. there, uh, which later on uh, his daughter says, oh, he only speaks the truth. No, no, he was just mad, actually. He, mm-hmm. he would, like, you know, smack people, kill people, all that mm-hmm. kind of fun stuff. Mm-hmm. So, but whatever, you know, mad, I guess. Uh, we don't care about him or her. <laughs> no. So yeah, it's okay. Just, don't worry about it. Yeah, they just appear in the last 15 <laughs> seconds anyway. Oh, yeah. but, but good, for goodness sakes, when she sews up, though, he listens to her as if she is speaking the absolute truth at that exact moment and questions nothing. Which is what got him into this pickle in the first place, according to the film's narrative. Yeah. Don't, don't, no. He learned nothing. He learned nothing. Yeah, like, you know, he gets there and he's like, oh, wait, I've been tricked into invading France? Oh, goodness, now let me go kill my minister with a knife to the head. The, the lack of understanding how politics worked in this era just mm-hmm. really floored me. So uh, Henry IV was a usurper king. I mean, he was just mm-hmm. another faction within, in, within English politics. Mm-hmm. Like, people seem to think that it's some sort of monolithic structure where there's a king at the top and everybody else just obeyed. Mm-hmm. No, man. I mean, English politics, since even before the Norman Conquest, has always been pow- centered around these really powerful lords and, mm-hmm. like, you know. And a real, really strong sense of the value of law. Yeah. That's something that I respect about English history is Rule that even by consent. back. 
Yeah, even even back if we're talking about like 1066 before that, there's a strong sense of legal value. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, and that was part of the reason that uh, Hotspur rebelled, which they barely touch on in the film, Mm -hmm. that, you know, the king's like, oh, I want your your Scottish hostages. And, you know, Hotspur's like, oh, well, you also haven't paid for the ransom of my cousin. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the value of hostages in this era drives so much of the narrative of what's going on Mm -hmm. and never comes up in the film. Mm -hmm. So if you're not aware, basically in battles during this era, don't think about it like murdering someone with a hammer. Instead, think of it kind of like rugby, I guess, or Mm -hmm. football. Your goal is to knock the other guy down and drag him out behind you somewhere. And he's like, oh, oh, uh, fair cop, I give. And And because... It's basically rich guys in really thick metal suits that can't be killed for the most part because mm-hmm. longbows can't go through it, crossbows can't, and you know, with rare exceptions, most of the weapons can't. Mm-hmm. And you kind of don't want to. You kind of don't want to kill them because oh, exactly. then you're up for on the chopping block. Yeah. So in the the whole idea is that once you knock them down, they're like, oh, okay, you know, and because they know they can ransom back because these mm-hmm. have the money to do it, and mm-hmm. so you know, people's entire livelihoods are built around ransoming back expensive prisoners. So when the king demands those Scottish prisoners back, he's really saying, I want the ransom money, Mm -hmm. which is a big no-no. You know, when you get to the final battles at the end where they're just like massacring people, Mm -hmm. you know, back to the Dauphin again. (laughs) You know, Robert Pattinson does this great pratfall right there, which apparently he filmed himself where he's with this sword like slipping in the mud he's working so hard he's that working man's working so, so hard. you know what actually i'll give it to all of the the primary cast oh, working yeah. so hard really good job guys and he just flops on the ground and then they run up and have four people stab him to death never mind the fact that this man could have been ransomed back for how much of a kingdom additionally well the the whole thing they could have just ransomed him back and there's no need to really surrender they could just take the whole thing it's just Right? Yeah, Unless pretty I'm, much. Okay. Okay. I mean, it's just a like misunderstanding of how the era worked. I, oh, I that just... doesn't happen, by the way. I just, oh, for yeah. anybody who, that does not happen in history. Okay. <laughs> not only that, the Dauphin wasn't even there. He wasn't mm-hmm. even at the Battle of Agincourt. He died of dysentery hanging out with his dad in Rouen, like, two months later. He just wasn't even part of the whole campaign. Mm-hmm. But they needed a villain, and for some reason they borrowed from Henry V for that scene in particular. I don't mm-hmm. know. Just these weird choices. If you can't tell, I, I, this is not a film that I particularly liked mm-hmm. I, at the end of the day. I, I just felt like if you're going to do Henry V, do Henry V. Mm-hmm. If you're going to do historical Henry V, if you're going to do that historical story, cool, go for that. You know, really mm-hmm. double down on it. Mm-hmm. But this sort of like, bastardization of neither, really. Mm-hmm. I, I just don't know what the inspiration was behind this film at the end of the day. I mean, I can feel like someone saying, oh, we want to do Henry V, but with better language. Mm-hmm. Okay, I guess. <laughs> Or with a more contemporary moral. What I like about the Shakespeare play is that it's all about what does it really mean to be a true leader? Mm -hmm. And that is the question that he is asking throughout that play and the reason that he has to shed these things of childhood. And it's really painful. And that becomes a metaphor for us all. We might not actually have to kill our childhood friends in our lives, but there's a there, we metaphorically have to kill our childhood selves in order to move into adulthood. I mean, that's really painful for everyone. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't really happen in this film. I can't think of how I'm supposed to align with Henry and learn and grow with him and what I can take from his life and see in my own life or in the universe. I don't know. I got to the end. I was like, what did I learn? What did I get here? Where am I? Where am I? Henry V didn't want to invade France. That's what you learned. <laughs> then he was right the whole time. I, I guess. I, I yeah, know. the whole. It's definitely a, a modern anti-war sentiment mm-hmm. applied back onto a story where they had to change so much of a characterization to mm-hmm. make that work. It's like there, there are so many opportunities throughout history you could have used right there. Yeah, but there's this a lot is of, the yeah. one where you want to apply this to. Yeah, there's a Ugh. lot of great opportunities for that. Yeah, and I, I kind of feel like if you wanted to make it your your own story that there are great vehicles for that science fiction and fantasy are really great vehicles for testing out moral systems and moral choices Mm -hmm. well it's that classic debate that people have again and again it's like you know if you're telling a historic story Mm -hmm. how much of history do you have to tell properly Mm -hmm. and what do you owe to your audience is it something that you must slavishly follow or is it something that you can tweak bits and pieces so long as it has the main throughfoot and the feeling Mm -hmm. in this case 
I don't think they did either. It's just sort of all over the place. You know, they 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 didn't tell the history correctly, and they also didn't keep the yeah, spirit of it. Yeah, I just don't think this so. was the this was the best vehicle for the story that they wanted to tell. Yeah. So if you're going to choose to tell a history, see that it is the best vehicle for the story that you want to tell. So that's that would be my advice <laughs> to those who want to delve into historical fiction. Yeah. Oh goodness. Yeah. I just want to complain about the battle for like five minutes. That's where I'm at right now. Golly. Mm-hmm. Oof, that was painful to watch. I mean, mm-hmm. the thing is... It, it, it felt heavy. What I did like heavy. about it is you it know, felt weighty. It, it was well choreographed. I mean, yet again, everybody wants to have their own Battle of the Bastard sequence now where they have a you know one continuous shot throughout the entire sequence, which I guess that's just the new thing. Yeah, uh, I felt like they stole a lot of shots from that moment, but maybe didn't do it with as much energy mm-hmm. because they were keeping this monotone consistency across. <laughs> Also, they don't want to encourage war, so it's very hands off from it in a weird sort of way. Right? Yeah, there was a there was a distance actually in the whole in the yeah whole, hmm. in the fight and all that. Yeah, just know. the whole film, it felt like we were kind of at a distance. That's interesting. That's an interesting choice. You okay? No, I was really excited about this film. Yeah, he really was. This is one of these movies. I mean, it's one of those really seminal moments in history where something so specific happens it's one of the very few battles that is actually decides so much it's decisive where history becomes say. legend as well you yeah know, you know, it's so larger than life and so there's so much surrounding and attached to it i mean you know basically have an army that's overwhelmed by dysentery you know they, they tried their best and then you know comes up against this overwhelming force of you mm-hmm. know frenchmen on both sides and you know, so you really have the best of both worlds really going at it right there and there's so much belief on both sides and what they were doing and Mm -hmm. you never feel the conviction on either side Mm -hmm. you you know henry in this film never felt like what he was doing was right he never believed in his own cause you know the saint crispin's day speech of henry v is one of those moments that even shakespeare says it's paraphrased from something that actually occurred Mm -hmm. you know that the man did his best right there and then chalamet does this just this half-assed speech right there that wouldn't have inspired anyone. No. And it's no, just, it's you know, so it, it feels like people are embarrassed to make historical films these days. You know, they don't want to believe what they're putting up on there. They don't want to believe that people actually have conviction. Mm-hmm. That, you know, right or wrong, they would have made a choice that strong. Nobody right. makes that strong of choices anymore, I guess is what they're saying. Right, or believes in a, in a cause that would lead them to their own death. But there was a time and a place, and there still are times and places where that happens so we need to examine it understand Mm -hmm. it in order to understand our human selves so you just you can't flinch away from it and when art starts flinching away from those very (coughs) human elements and possibilities just becomes very flat and that's i mean that's another thing that happens in henry v in the play not to you know get too obsessed about it but he goes throughout the camp and sits down with common soldiers in the mid- in the night before the battle and then gives them a rousing speech. I don't care about anybody in this film. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the front line that he's speaking to, there's no one that they can cut to to give me a sense of, yes, that person is being inspired. You know what? Well, uh, we did look at uh, Falstaff for about two seconds during the speech, which you're right. We don't see any common people anywhere during this film. It's no. basically him and Falstaff, and that's it. Yeah. All they huh. have is Falstaff to, for us to care about in that moment. There is no one else. Who also was the writer of this film, by the way. So the, the same actor who was playing that right there was also the... Yeah, but how can he have any pride in that moment? So we're supposed to see through another character's eyes and take pride in, in what great. Henry is accomplishing here. Yeah. And we can't do that. We cannot access that because... Falstaff doesn't have those feelings really about this moment. As far as I know, that's the last big historical film kind of on the horizon right now. There's nothing else really big. I do find it interesting that. No, oh, but if, well, if anybody does know something that is on the horizon. Oh, yeah, please comment like below. Yeah, yeah, I'm always super big in this, you know. It's, it's funny that the last two big historic films have both been on Netflix. Yeah. That, you know, they seem to be willing to invest in these films where nobody else is. And I hope they continue to do so. Oh, yeah. I just want them to choose different, <laughs> different films. <laughs> You know, ironically, I mean, The Last Kingdom is on um, Netflix right now. You know, Mm -hmm. they're partly sponsoring it through the BBC, Mm -hmm. getting rave reviews. People love it. So it's not all bad. (laughs) No, yeah. And and there's a a lot to like here. Next big film on the horizon is The Last Duel. Oh, that's right. Which I have looking forward to that. So 
it sounds weird to say, you know, I always make these historic hype videos and people are like, oh, we're, you know, you get hyped every time. Of course I do, man. I love, I love this stuff. It's fun. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'll talk about that one in a future broadcast. But that's uh, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon teaming mm-hmm. back up with the original writers and directors of Goodwill Hunting to mm-hmm. bring you a medieval epic in 1425, actually. So the exact same era as the one we just watched. Mm-hmm. And I but- can't help but wonder what theirs is going to look like and how it's going to feel different. If you're interested, you should read the book. Oh, good God, yes. It is such a good book. It's a great little mystery, and you can visit your local public library to do that. So thanks for listening, and tune in again next time for our next historic film review.